Welcome to the Designing Hollywood podcast in association with The John Campia Show. I am your host, Robert Meyer Burnett. This episode is sponsored by Paris Costumes International. Today's guest, Jenny Tamim, is a brilliant award-winning costume designer born in France, the daughter of owners of French wedding wear companies, and from a young age, she created dresses for her dolls. She graduated in art history, she started her career as a fashion editor at Elle magazine, but soon started working in the film industry in Holland. She gained respect, and after moving to London, she joined the teams of everything from the Harry Potter movies to the James Bond films. Her costumes for the Potter films are much beloved by fans, as evidenced by sold-out tours when the costumes are displayed in traveling exhibits and all the carefully precise cosplay that attempts to recreate Hermione's Yule Ball dress or Harry's Quidditch robes. With Black Widow, she proved to be one of the best in the business, looking to the uniforms of the Russian and Norwegian armies for inspiration. Her most recent work, House of the Dragon, which the costume design evidently is so important and it shows as it subconsciously affects how viewers perceive the characters and can help perpetuate the main aspects of the plot. Only a few episodes have aired of House of the Dragon, however. The costumes of the characters we met so far are some of the most effective examples of the power of good costume design for a TV series we've seen in a very long time. Without further ado, it is my great pleasure to welcome costume designer Jenny Tamim to the Designing Hollywood show. I have to ask, going over your, your filmography, I. I, I just, I had read that you started with fashion design from a very young age. Uh, were you were you born with the desire to create the work that you create now? And did you always want to get into the film industry? Well, I don't know. I don't know if I was born with that. I don't know that. But I know that I like to dress my doll and I never dress them with modern things i wanted to dress them in costume then i could play with them and imagine little script where they were playing with each other or interfering or i, I was already creating little costume drama yeah <laughs> that was my thing even very 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 old yeah and then uh, i went on not anymore with doll now i'm doing it with actors but uh, <laughs> but you're still you're still pretending, which is which is great. I'm still pretending. Oh yes, yes, I do. I do, I do. Now a lot of uh, a lot of the people that we've interviewed for this show talk about a, a rigorous academic background. That it's really important to have a a sense of everything from art history to understanding fabrics to understanding how light plays on. I mean, even canvases, the frescoes of the the masters. Um, did you have a very very rigorous academic background to get into costume design? I do. I, I have a master in, uh, in old language. Uh, I, 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 was, I was supposed to become a, a teacher of Latin, but it didn't happen because <laughs> um, I was very active in the 1968 student revolution and my, my career, my academic career turned <laughs> quite bitter at that moment. And then, but I had done art history in the same time as one of the certificates that you have to do. And then I enter Elle magazine because they were at that time recruiting young, political, intelligent talent. <laughs> <laughs> they started me and very quickly. I met an actor there that I was interviewing and I thought, well, that's my chance to work in cinema because cinema was my passion from very after the dolls when i stopped playing with dolls i started watching film and i was really and i was so happy uh, to um, to be able to work in film i mean i had that opportunity via him to work in film and I, I i stopped fashion and i started in film and the only department where they could put me as a trainee was costume because at least i knew what a hanger was so <laughs> i <laughs> I started there and very, very quickly uh, was assistant designer. That was in France. I worked a year in France and then two years in France. And then I married a Dutchman, went to Amsterdam. And Amsterdam was really the, the great period of the Dutch cinema. You know, I had a chance of working with Marlene Horis uh, uh, to meet Paul Verhoeven. That was a very big, that was a, a big moment in the Dutch cinema, Dick Maas. 
And um, that's where I started. But very quickly, I started working everywhere else. Uh, Amsterdam is a small town, but Holland is in the middle of Europe, so I could go everywhere, and I started doing, started an international career. I, I grew up in Seattle, and a lot of Dutch cinema would come to Seattle and play theatrically. So I met people like uh, uh, Fons Rademacher, Monique van de Ven, and then, of course, Paul Verhoeven and, and, and Jos Vacano and Jan de Bont. And it, it, I feel I, I saw all of the movies that were made in the 70s and 80s from Holland. And well, they were my friend. They were my friend. I mean, Monique and Jan are, are still my friend. It was, it was a fantastic group. I mean, I lost it now because I'm, I'm not anymore in Holland as much. Uh, I'm not anymore in Holland. But um, 20 years, I mean, 25 years I live in London now. But uh, when I was, in my time, the Dutch cinema was very strong and very active. And they all left for Hollywood, of course. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, you know, I, uh, I met Rene, Rene Stoutsendijk. I know I'm... I'm I mean... I mean and then she was in in Spetters and The Fourth Man, and uh, she took my heart away when I met her. I was I was young. I don't know. She, they were they were great actresses, and then, but Dutch are very good in export. When they have something good, they export it. You know what they do with their butter, they do with their cinema <laughs> technician. So they will never keep it, and they will export it. And they all went to Los Angeles. They all had successful career. Maybe the actresses less. No, not not all the actresses. Some actresses did well in the, in LA, and some did less well. You know. When you life. when you were growing up in France, did you were you watching a lot of? I mean, it was a, you were you were a student in '68. There was some amazing French cinema. Yeah. Uh, you know, Godard and Truffaut and and Jacques Demy yeah. and and uh, all of the stuff that was happening in French cinema in the '60s. Stuff like Breathless. Uh, were you a, were you a fan of French cinema? Well, actually, I grew up until I was twelve. I grew up in Algeria because it was a war in Algeria. So the only film I could see were the Egyptian musical. <laughs> so that was the I grew up with the Egyptian. When uh, I don't know what the, that singer was called, Omar. I, I, I cannot remember, but I, they were all those musical with all those dancers, beautiful black and white scenery. That's how I grew up with. When I arrived in Paris, it was indeed the Nouveau Cinema with all those incredible people. I, I mean, Godard, his first film. Truffaut, I grew up with Truffaut. I was the girlfriend of Jean-Pierre Léo. That's how I started in cinema. And they put me, so I started with, uh, yeah, yeah, I was lucky and unlucky because <laughs> I married another man. But, but um, yeah, uh, I started with, uh, I. I the French cinema then was incredible. incredible. Now as well, you know, they, nobody can make a, a comedy like the French. The French are very, very strong for comedy. Oh, ab absolutely. Now, you know, you, you did a lot of work in, in Holland and, and you really lot, got to hone your craft. And then you, you made a jump into, I mean, huge Hollywood productions. Was that something difficult for you? Was, was, was going from... Uh, Holland and Dutch cinema, and then moving to Hollywood was that a was that no, a, a no, no. no? It went it went quite smoothly because I started doing a film of Sluizer in in London, uh, and then and from George Sluizer in London, and then and then was I was it? lucky because uh, the Dutch cinema had those those Oscar, you know there was the. Uh, um, there was two Oscars of the Dutch cinema. One was the Marlon Horry's film. Um, I don't know what was the name in English. And the other one was Character. Character and Marlon, Marlon Horry, she had that incredible film. So there was two Oscars, one uh, from, the, from the best uh, uh, international film, which were given to the two Dutch films, and I had done the costume. So from the from that moment on, I could immediately get an agent in London. Mm. At least my work was seen by everybody, and I started doing a film in London called Gangster Number no. One. Yeah. And the producer and the producer was Norma Heyman, the mother of David Heyman, and Alfonso Cuarón saw character, and he loved the costume, and. David Hammond and Alfonso 
So they, they knew me from two different sides, David from his mom and Alfonso because he had seen character. And they asked me for Harry Potter, which was actually um, for them uh, a lot of courage. Um, but, um, but they knew, <laughs> they, they believed in me. And that's how I, um, I started. But that was my big break. And that was Alfonso who chose me because he had seen the costume of character. What was that like for you? I mean, these Harry Potter movies are some of the biggest productions ever in Hollywood. And, and you're jumping into a worldwide phenomenon. Did you feel any pressure to, to and, and prison? No, at that time, every film was a success, but every film arrived at the time. It was not a mondial phenomenon like it became later on. We were really shooting it like a big film. Yes, it was a big film, but... Alfonso was taking it like an art film because it's his way of working. Um, David Hammond is one of the best producers I know and he was taking it also as an art film. Uh, it was a small crew, we had the kids, we had to be careful how to shoot the times we were shooting with the kids. It did not have, um, but also, maybe also because we were shooting in, in London, it did not have the character of a huge, of a huge, uh, 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 big Hollywood film. It was very family oriented, I thought, mm. because of the kid. Sure. So you didn't feel pressure, but I mean, it. It. How did? How... But, you, but you feel. You, you feel pressure all the time. You feel pressure on a, on a, on the fifty thousand uh, uh, on the on a five million film, and you feel pressure on a on a five hundred million. And you know, it, you always feel pressure. I think you might even feel more pressure when there's no budget and when it's budget, because when it's budget, you can make mistakes, and when there's no money, you cannot make any mistakes. So I think that you feel more pressure when you don't have the money. Now, you, your uh, relationship with Alfonso Cuaron became an ongoing relationship where you did some amazing work together on, yeah. on films like Gravity and Children of Men, some astonishing work, and you're working with him now. How did the relationship yeah. with the two of you develop? He already liked your work. Um, was it an easy yeah, she, relationship between the two of you? Yeah, yeah, easy. Well, nothing is easy with Alfonso, <laughs> but uh, uh, I don't think I think nothing is easy with me either. So uh, it's a it's a very very good, very deep relationship. But um, you know, it's uh, it's always trying to find the best. I think we. We, what we both have in common is that we always try to do the best we can. We, we don't let go. You know, we don't let, we don't make it, uh, we don't make it easy. We always try to, to do the maximum of our possibility. How do the two of you begin a project together? Do you read the script and go to him with ideas? Does he tell you what he's looking for and then you explore? How do, how do you work with a director like that? I think every director has a different approach, but with Alfonso, what I find remarkable is that he always surprised me. Whatever I could think when I read the script, I think, oh, I read the script, I think I understand what he wants, and then he tells me something which I never expected. <laughs> and that's what makes an, a fantastic, that's what, that's what makes a genius director. Somebody who sees things and wants you to see things on a way which could be provocative, maybe you can call it like that, but at least completely different and that's what you were expecting. So you always feel unstable. Mm. That's what I always feel. Mm. I'm never in a comfort zone because you know that the comfort zone is so bad for creativity. When you start feeling comfortable, you are doing a mechanical job. When you are doing a mechanical job, you are not going on top of your possibilities. And I think that's in costume, like in production design, like in camera. Now I'm working with Chivo. I mean, Chivo, not one white is right. You know, <laughs> I had 25 colors of white for gravity. And now I have, I don't know, it's never the right blue. It's never the right, you know. Those people are so extraordinarily talented that 
just to catch up with them, it's, it's wonderful. I, I, I feel honored to work with that sort of talent. Well, when you brought it keeps up- keeps you alive and keeps you young. <laughs> uh, absolutely. Now, when, when I, I love the, the, the idea of color. Obviously, it's never the white, r- white and never the right blue is, is, a, is a, a fascinating idea because you as a costume designer also have to work with the color palette of both production designers and the director of photography. And so how do you interface in terms of, <laughs> obviously you need to have the camera, the costumes ready when the cameras roll, but if you can't get the right blue, so how, 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 how do you collaborate with like a Chivo? Do you go to him early on in the process and say, this is the colors I want to use? <laughs> it's take and give. Not every uh, GOP, uh, they are not all that, uh, specific. Some GOPs are easier to work with or accept what you do. And it's also depending if you work uh, outside, inside, if you work for television, if you work for, for film, if you work. It's very, it goes, it's very different. Um, it depends on who you work with. Are you building your own Costumes? Do you work with a team of people that you keep with you from show to show to show? How active? Yes, I, yes, I, tend, to, I tend to, but uh, sometimes they go and you have to discover. I discovered new talent on Game of Thrones. I had I had some people that I knew, um, and I take sometimes over two generations. Sometimes I get the daughter or the son of somebody who was working with me 20 years because I'm so old now, so I have to work with two two generations. Um, but I discovered some new people, new talent on Game of Thrones. We had I had the. Uh, a new cutter, a new embroiderer, and that, that was really nice to to meet uh, to meet a, a new generation of talent. Quite interesting. I have a new assistant now, who is also brilliant, and and they are people in the thirties with completely different aesthetic than I have. And very stimulating. Very stimulating. I think I think uh, the people that watch this show that are starting out in the business will love to hear you say that. Uh, that's a very inspirational thing to hear. So it's terrific that you feel that way. Of course, I mean, we, I'm not saying that I grew up with Technicolor, but we did grow up with another sense of aesthetic, and than now, and it's extremely good to mix in a team some young talent, because they do bring something in their way of looking at things that I would not think of. And it's good to listen. It's very good to listen and to try to understand what they can bring you. When you worked on the Harry Potter films, six, yeah, six, 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 six of them, during that time... And the two... And the two, and the two uh, the, I mean, I, I remember Deathly the, Hollows the part one and two. Yeah, when, yeah, yeah, yeah. when you were working on the films, did you, because the kids obviously were growing up as the years went by in Hogwarts, did you have an idea uh, about how to evolve the costume designs to sort of show that they were getting older and getting more experienced? No, no. everything was very spontaneous because we never knew what the next book will be. So it was, that was keep it so alive. We didn't know. Sometimes we were thinking, is he going to die? What is he going? What is it? You know, what is your answer? And she would give us, you know, the writer will give us some ideas. And, but that's what makes it so fresh. Uh, every film was a new adventure. And the kids, they were growing naturally. So we were fitting their uniform and whoops, they were 10 centimeters too short and we had to try to, 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 to give them another clothes because they were now really much more men, much more women. And then they started having little affairs with each other. It was all very, very, very exciting, you know. Now, obviously you got to clothe some great villains. Uh, the, there's, there's great antagonists in the Harry Potter films, whether you're talking- I love villain, I love villain. What, what is the secret to dressing a great villain? To make him very sexy. <laughs> villain should be sexy. <laughs> but you know, I had also great villain in, in, in the James Bond film that I did that you don't mention, but- Oh, we're gonna get there. 
<laughs> I'm a huge I'm James gonna... Bond fan. <laughs> no, 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 me too. And then, and then, I love my villain. I think villains should be gorgeous and beautiful. That's why they are so villain because they are dangerous because they seduce you. And that's what I. That's why I love the character of my Smith Demon. When uh, when I met my Smith, I said you are going to be a gorgeous villain because you are so good looking. And you are going to be a, a heartbreaker for all those girls who are going to fall for the wrong guy, as usual. <laughs> and, and I had, but it's also the same if it is a woman, like, you know, like, I, I love Bellatrix. I love Bellatrix. Elaine Bonacarter in Bellatrix. Oh, my God. She was divine, divine. And, and I love her so much. She's my, one of my favorite costumes of all time, costume of Bellatrix. When you work with somebody like Helena Bonham Carter and creating a look for Beatrix Lestrange, do you work together? Do you accept the input from oh, the actor? Oh, yes. Elena, yes. She knows. She knows. And it's never far enough for her. And she plays the part and she jumps and she shows you. And then, you know, we had to open the sleeves because she wanted to really put her arm like that. So we had to open the sleeve. So it's a wonderful design detail, but it's based on the fact that she wanted really to move those sleeves like a windmill. So that's why we opened the sleeve and it became the trademark of her costume. But uh, that was Elena. Yeah, incredible, incredible work. I mean, the, the design work in the Harry Potter movies is it's just sumptuous. And, and in between the Harry Potter movies, you did In Bruges. And I love that film. I mean, that's a terrific but Martin. You know, I love, I love uh, art, uh, art, art film. This is where I grew up with, and I love art film. And when I read that script, I thought, what a jewel. What a little jewel. I really want to do it. I had to convince them. I said, you know, I can do a small film without money. Please take me. They, they were afraid. <laughs> they thought, you're going to spend all the money. In the first costume, I said, no, 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 I want to do that film. He said, but why? It's three costumes. I said, because the script is brilliant. Because I want, I want, I want to do it. And I never regretted working with him was three months of pleasure. It's a great film. I, you did a great job with those costumes. And, well, you know, was it hard? I mean, going from, obviously, a big Warner Brothers movie with the Harry Potter series and then, and then downshifting, like you said, doing an art film like in Bruges, did, do you have a different approach? <laughs> Or is it the same? No, the same creative approach. It was like a holiday. You know, you, instead of having to do 20 double, you had no double. That's it. And when, for the, 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 the worst on those big productions is that you cannot think, oh my God, I found two beautiful meters of fabric. I'm doing a little shirt. No, because you have to have 17 shirts. So you have to get 100 meters of fabric. And that's where the big production starts. You know, it's not so much in the creative process. It is in the, in the productional process of the costume that you are limited by the level. The bigger the production is, you have not one shooting team, especially on television, but three shooting team. So you have to have a big crew. So you don't have a one-to-one interaction with your standby. You have so many standby, you don't even know their name. And then so your costume are like that given to somebody else. Then you have 17 double, you have a stuntman wearing your costume. I mean, on bone, suddenly I could see this guy huge like that because he was the only one who could drive wearing my little gorgeous little suit. Boom, you know, it was, it was, it, it was, it's, the frustration comes to that more by the size of the, the size of the projection sometimes makes it very frustrating. But when you do a little jewel like in Bruges, it's holidays. It's, yeah, it's a fantastic film. Now, a, a, another movie that you, before I get to James Bond, I, I have to ask about Gravity. Another Caron film. Uh, I heard the production of that film was, was a difficult production because it was, took a long time to do right. Um, again, you were creating things based in NASA technology and it had to look absolutely real. What was it like working on a film like Gravity? Because it was so unusual to make. And like you said, everything Alfonso Cuaron does is impossible. So when, how did he approach you to do Gravity? And, and, and did, you, did you do a lot of uh, uh, research with, say, NASA, uh, the yeah. actual? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I did a lot of research and then I thought, forget the research. She has to look good. <laughs> and, 
They have to look good. And then what was extraordinary is that we first did the costume uh, in 3D, because we, we first shot the animation. So I designed the costume with Alfonso next to me, and we said, the trousers shorter, longer, the line lower. The... And then when that was done, we had to put the fait accompli to Georges Clunet and Sandra Bullock and saying, okay, you have to wear that because this is already shot in, uh, in, uh, in a cartoon, you know, fine. <laughs> and, but they were fantastic. I mean, they're amazing. And they accepted, but it was hard to find the fabric, to dye it to the perfect beige, the perfect white. And we had, we had a, a certain color for inside, for outside of the cap. It was very technical. And then, of course, never open in the front, but she had to open in the front for the end. So um, that was not right. But I got some good comments from the aeronautic people saying that it was quite clever what I had done. I mean, I never get any critique from that sort of, uh, <laughs> never had any article, that sort of magazine. But they were quite happy with what I had done. So it looks quite good, I think. Oh, it's a, the film is incredible. I mean, I, I saw it in IMAX. And I, I, I was tense the whole time. You know, you just curled up in a little yeah, ball. Yeah, yeah. Incredible! It's incredible. Now, after after you did did Gravity, I mean, your 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 filmography. You just you took the, the projects get bigger and more exciting. I mean, you did James Bond. You worked on the most successful James Bond film ever made in Skyfall. Everyone looks to that film, and you talk about a sexy villain. My God, the villain in Skyfall is uh silva first of all i gotta ask you were you a james bond fan growing up did you yes. watch the films yes i'm a complete james bond fan and i remember when i met sam Mendes, it was like one fan to another <laughs> they were really talking about james bond like that and then and then sam said to me now we are going to try to understand why he is james bond and we have to give him we, we have to make him think. And from that moment on, the whole, the whole, the whole design uh, was there. Why is he wearing that? Why is he wearing that? Why is he choosing that? And from and the moment that you are starting to understand why he chose that tie, why he chose the shape of that jacket, why he chose that, you, 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 have, you have the character. And it looks so raw because we wanted to make him like that. You know, we wanted to make him a, a, a kill machine or, or an action machine. And that's what we did. That's what I did. Now, did very you, do you have a favorite? You can't say Daniel Craig, but of the other James Bonds, did you have a favorite? I mean, a, a favorite film to, before you worked on? The first, the first one, the one and only. <laughs> I'm glad you said that because I'm, I'm a big Sean Connery fan as well. I mean, well, and you know that in the, in the fitting room, I always had a big picture of Sean Connery pushing his cufflink like that. And I remember that every time I was trying something on Daniel Gregg, he was looking at Sean Connery. <laughs> well, in Skyfall, Daniel Craig actually has a moment where he fixes his cufflink. So, was that something you told him to do? No, of course not. Daniel is brilliant. But I had that picture in the dressing room. <laughs> now, Javier Bardem as Silva was one of the great Bond villains, and clearly... He's so funny. He's so funny. He's the most... He's the funniest guy with Clooney. He's the funniest guy that I ever, ever, ever dressed. He is wonderful to work with. He is great. And he assume is He knows that he is gorgeous, and he and he wants to be gorgeous. Is one maybe that's maybe that's a sort of a of Mediterranean guy. I don't know. He said, "Make me look good." You know, they, they are people saying that. What well, an Englishman would never say that. We never did. They, they yeah. would not dare say that. But the uh, 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 said, "Yeah, make me look good. I have to be in front of Bond, and I have to be as sexy as Danielle. So, okay, make me look good." <laughs> <laughs> Now, did you and Sam Mendes and Javier Bardem work together in, say, because I, I kind of love the color palette of his suits that he was wearing, like, especially when we first meet him. Yeah, yeah, no, no, it was, it was not, um, it was, Xavier and 
Javier and I, we tried different look, going from the kimono to the white suit, passing by so many things. We tried so many things. And then we finish with that because I just, I, I looked at the decor and fashion designer was brilliant. And I look at the decor and it says heat. And, and I said, you know, it's going to be hot, heat. So we need those light colors. And from that moment on, the costume was designed. Hmm. When, we, when we understood the, the heat, the, you know, like that sort of compression, you, it appeals for, uh, uh, colors, light colors. And then, no, and then it went quite quickly from that point on. Another, uh, in Skyfall, Dame Judi Dench, her costumes were uh, just terrific because they, they were both, they were both strong and powerful, yet they still were feminine in a way. And, and she was, I don't think she's ever looked better in a movie than she looked in Skyfall. And what, what was it? Oh, what was it like? I mean, I loved her clothes in the film. What was it like when you took on, obviously she started in the Bond franchise in 1995 in GoldenEye with Pierce Brosnan, but what you, you gave her a, a different feel. And when you were approaching dressing M, how did you start? Was she based on a, a real character in history or was, did you bring something to the way you made her look that might've been something no. we don't know? Yeah, I was inspired by, in, in France we have a, we have a, a minister, a French minister who is always extremely elegant. And I wanted um, her to be elegant, but not what you, I didn't want her to look like her job. I just wanted her to look like uh, an elegant woman who has a very high job, makes a lot of money, lives obviously in Chelsea on what we shot and is proud of the way she looks. I wanted to give her that, you know, that pride of, um, of herself. I wanted to make her look beautiful and not, not associate to the job. She could also be the CEO of L'Oreal. That's what I thought, you know, it doesn't matter that she's MI6, okay but she could also be the CIO of uh, L'Oréal or, or <laughs> Minister. Of, I, it doesn't matter. That's, uh, she is a woman. She's a powerful, high rank woman. That's what I thought. Well, I loved it. Now, when you're, when you're creating elegance, are there certain fabrics that you're drawn to that you would use uh, uh, that, that's, that just seem go-to fabrics that are elegant? Like, how, how do you bring yeah. elegance to M? How do you do that? Uh, I, al I always, when I think about fabric, I always think relief. They have to have a relief, a structure, and they have to have movement because movement and structure is what catch the camera. I don't really, the color depends of a lot of things. Depends of the character, what they play, the, the GOP, the decor, the, lots of things. But the fact that it moves, that it has a movement and a structure, that's very important because that's, that's, that gives a third dimension to it. Well, speaking of elegance, one of the most beautiful women to ever appear in a Bond film, and forgive my pronunciation, was... Uh, Bernice Marlowe as Severine, and when we first oh. when we first meet her, she's in this dress. Uh, I mean, jaw dropping. That dress was jaw dropping. She was jaw dropping. Uh, and you, whenever you're, I mean, a Bond girl is a staple of cinema all the way back to Doctor No in 1962 when Ursula Andress comes out of the water. But you got to, I, I mean, she was breathtaking. What was it like knowing? She, she breathtaking. I, I remember crossing the studio where we were in Pinewood, and I saw her walking with a waist like that in a, in a, in a black little dress with a, with a belt and walking. And I, 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 I entered the office of Sam Men and I said, who is that? It's a gorgeous creature outside. And he said, this is quite to me. I said, oh. I said, well, we found the girl. She was gorgeous. She's gorgeous. She's a gorgeous woman anyway. 
Well, the my dress. Yeah, how did how did you decide on that particular dress? Were there iterations of things that you thought, okay, did you always the want back. To... Back. the back? I thought the back is important because some always like to shoot the back and have the woman turning. So the back is always important with them. It's an incredible dress. Did, now, was that something that you manufactured, or is it couture? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We make, it. of course, of course, we made it. We made it. We made it. Yes, 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 yes. Outstanding. It took a long time, though. One, two, three. <laughs> uh, it, it was uh, quite, quite, quite amazing. Um, and then after, of course, Skyfall, you you did you work with Sam Mendes again on Spectre. Um, yeah. When you're going to work on on another James Bond movie. Do you approach it, your second James Bond movie, the same way you approach the first, or do you want to do something new? How do you and yeah, how do no, you make well, Bond Spec new? Oh, Spectre, Spectre was also Sam, so um, I knew that it was just the continuity of the character. So we did the same. I had the same ideas, but of course I had a new girl, I had a new villain, I had a situation in Mexico. Everything was very different. It was not the same. Um, because the situation was different, but the, the 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 philosophy behind was the same. Well, you had Christoph Waltz, uh, another yeah. another, which again, you you wanted a villain to look sexy. His outfits were sexy, Inspector. <laughs> yeah, and then I gave him something in velour, something soft, because I just wanted something soft on him. You know that you think. Because he has that thing, he's Austrian, huh? he's not German, he's Austrian. And Austrians are very suave. So, and he, and Christophe, when you make, when you make, he's very suave, he's a very soft man, very gentle. So that's why I gave him this green velour, very tactile. And maybe nobody sees it, but I could see, I could feel it. Uh, well, we could see it. No, it was fantastic. And then also in the film, you had, you had Naomi Harris, Monica Bellucci, and of course, Leah Sadu, three very oh. incredibly uh, beautiful women, but all all different, you know, different kinds of different looks. Uh, and I really think you did a great job uh, of, of, of dressing those women. How do you give in a, in a film like a Bond movie? How do you how do you make the women, the Bond girls, the Bond women different? How do you give them personality through their clothes? Well, they have them. They are, I was lucky to work with actresses with great personality anyway, like uh, Naomi, she wears colors like nobody else, so I just went for the colors. Um, Lea is so elegant in herself, you know, you, the, the, it has to be very simple with Lea because she fills it up with her personality and, and with, and, and with uh, Monica, with Monica, I, I made it very 50s. I mm. thought about all the, all the um, black. I, I make her really like a, a, a film noir heroine. That was uh, uh, that was my 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 concept for her. That she is the the, the typical bad, dangerous woman. She's a black widow. <laughs> <laughs> And you also another great staple, uh, another great villain in Dave Batista, and and Dave Batista being being a wrestler and obviously being uh, he's a big guy. How do you approach dressing someone like Dave? Do you do you also make him because he's? He was he... so happy that we made him suit. We had suit made for him, and he was so happy to wear a suit, and he was taking picture of himself, and he just left his jogging trousers for. Uh, all met suit and he was walking differently and he asked us to make for him a dark blue tuxedo for his wedding so he, <laughs> <laughs> but he was completely into it he, he changed he changed i love him he was such a nice man when you're making clothes for someone like dave batista obviously he had to he has a great fight scene with daniel craig do you have to make special clothes 12, that'll survive 12 suits 12. We made 12 to the same. That's what I was telling you, you know, so it's not, it's like the production is, is big, more than the idea, because you design the first suit and then you have to make 12 the same. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's a great, 
again, the clothes in these, Sam Mendes, obviously you and Sam Mendes and clothes work very well together. So kudos to what you did on those Bond films because my God, do they look good. Uh, another film that you did that I particularly liked was Passengers. You know, there are not a lot of costumes in Passengers, but a beautiful film. And all the work you did, I mean, obviously you've got Chris Pratt and Jennifer Lawrence and you, you have a, you have a, a robot bartender, but there's not a lot of people in that film, but uh, Guy Hendricks Dias was the production designer and it's a really beautiful, beautiful movie. Um, did you yes. like working on the film? And yes, very much, very much so, because I thought, um, or you put people and they are all like green little men. Or if you design for them, you try to design something which is good now, which could be good in 10 years, in 20 years, sort of intemporal. And I think I made it intemporal. I use fabric which were, at the contrary, looking like not handmade, uh, not manual made, but like fabric made, really like flat thing. And at the contrary, for Chris Pratt, I use workman clothes like like he's a workman that's the only thing that he can do he's a workman and i gave him the essence of the workman uniform the overall and um, because then he was he was because that has no time either so it was the opposition between a workman and a sophisticated woman and i just used color like all sort of gray color white, gray, gray, green, gray, blue for Jennifer, and it worked really well. And then suddenly she gets married, you know, and it's, it worked really well. Yeah, I really, really enjoyed the, the work in that film. Beautiful design all the way around, the production design, your work, incredible looking movie. Um, now, you, you worked recently with Marvel. It seems like it seems like now Marvel will eventually employ every high-end costume designer that w works in the business because, I mean, it, it's amazing to to see how many different designers have actually worked on the different Marvel movies and everybody brings something new to it. And obviously, you worked on Black Widow, and that was that was Black Widow's solo movie where we meet her sister Yelena. So you. Uh, had to design multiple iterations. Now, Marvel, we know, has their visual design department. So they've got things that they've already been toying with when people start. But I think that Black Widow has some really great superhero costumes in it, not just Black Widow, but of course, David Harbour was fantastic. It was my idea to use white. Oh, for, for the white, the, the snowsuit. It's incredible. So well, when you start, when you've worked on Bond and you've worked on these spy thrillers, how do you approach uh, a movie like Black Widow and where you're creating, you've got, uh, you've got a great villain in the Taskmaster, you've got the Black Widow in that new white suit. How did you, how did you find working on Black Widow and, and, and what was it like designing superhero costumes. So I approach it exactly the same way that I approach uh, the other film. Uh, the, the, uh, the idea of dressing her in white was actually mine, and they liked it. I thought it would be good to see her in white because she was going to the snow and the uniform, the Russian uniform is white to not see them in the snow. So I got that idea from that. And then they love the idea, and I made this black widow in white for the two girls, two different widows. The one of Elena is a little more Russian uh, yeah. style, a little bit. Uh, and the one of, uh, of, uh, of uh, Scarlett is, is amazing, and she looks fantastic in white. And I love doing, I love doing Red Bar. He was, he was lovely. He was lovely. David Bamber, lovely, lovely man. And then his costume is fantastic. Fantastic. Really fantastic. And I, I actually adore working with Marvel. It was really fun. You know, we had a funny time. Great director and a woman director, lovely woman. Yeah, Kate and Shortland. It was, it was, yeah, Kate Shortland. She, she also come from, from, from art film. She had done incredible film. 
law is brilliant and, and I was quite happy to work with her and I think we did a great job together. And to meet uh, to meet Elena, you know, to meet that young Florence, incredible, great cast. It was a lovely film to do. I really enjoyed it. Yeah, and also you you had great villains and great locations, and it really and the idea they used the white Black Widow in all of the advertising. You know, they had posters, and that that her in the white suit was very striking, and they used it a lot. So they obviously they clearly love that idea, and she's so iconic in that white suit now. I mean, it's 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 great. What was that made out of? Oh, we have a special fabric that we print ourselves. It's a sort of elastic. It's very technical. It's a rubber. It's a rubber fabric, and but we print. We design, I design a sort of little square, little pattern, and we print that pattern in it. Mm. So we print different pattern. So there will be like little square, little oval, little, so to not have it flat, to have some structure in it. And then uh, what I did um, in the making, we put the seam next to each other with a space in between of elastic. So she could move very, very well. And Scarlett told me that it was the most comfortable suit that she ever had <laughs> because of the way, of, because of the way we, we made it. So it was like put together, but under the seam was that half a centimeter of elastic which allowed her to move. And it was very comfortable. And she looks amazing. Looks, looks amazing, nice. amazing. And now it brings us to House of the Dragon. Uh, you know, Game of Thrones is probably one of the most successful television shows of all time. And and Westeros, the, the land, is one of the most richly designed worlds we've ever seen on television. Were you a Game of Thrones fan? Did you watch the series before you worked on House of the Dragon? Not really. I watched some episodes. Uh... I was not a fan, but I was also not an anti-fan. I was somebody who had watched some episode and thought it was looking great. <laughs> That's what I felt about. So when you, how did you get this job and, and, and how do you begin? Because it's not just designing clothes. You have to design a whole world. You have to design races. You know, what is old Valerian? What do, what do they look like? And the Targaryen dynasty, I mean. I was, so I was I was lucky because uh, when I got the job, it was the confinement, and I was in south of France, confined, couldn't get out for three months, and that's the moment. So I had lots of, uh, lots of uh, Zoom conversation with Ryan and Miguel, and we had time to develop ideas and design. So. Uh, for a month, I met some design, I met some mood board, and then I started designing some armor and some characters, and we were talking. So I was really lucky to have that, that, that time of preparation and thinking. And um, I, I could very clearly see it. And, uh, ah, it's a new world, yes, but the characters are so strong. The script were so amazing that it was not difficult to create the world. And the two showrunners, Miguel and Ryan, were so helpful. And the book, I read the book. I had plenty of time because I was stuck in Provence. So I read the book of George Martin. And, and the book gave me a very good idea because Fire and Blood, the book which exists. So, so I read it and then... I thought I could see the world. I could see the green and the black. I could see the woman, the power. And I could see that old empire of Valerian. Well, old empire of Valerian, we all have ancestry. So I don't think it's hard. Well, Valerian, Atlantis, whatever those worlds would disappear and were there, we all have been growing up with that. It's just a mythologic idea. I, I was... Um, I loved it. At the contrary, you you can put whatever you want in it. They, it is it is put in a medieval time because it's easier um, 
to put it in that time because indeed the technology is quite limited. They know how to work iron, they know how to paint, they have frescoes, but uh, they don't have computer or technology, so it has to be that time. But I use for the costume a lot, and it's also a world, so you have Asiatic influence, African influence, you can actually do whatever you want. You know, the sky is the limit. So I had that map where I knew where, what was the equivalency of London and Europa, where were Asia, where's the equivalency of Africa. I could see the, the, the movement between the people and that's how I could use some African and Asiatic influence on some costumes. And like the Velarion, you know, I'd really used a lot of, um, not, not African, but some of it, especially in the work on the armor, the metal work. I was quite, and, and then for, Vela, for, 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 for the Velarion, I was inspired by uh, Morocco a lot because of the, of the use of jewelry and the, the, the colors, the, the, the richness of the colors, and uh, and then I, I put a, I use a lot of elements, Renaissance, Quattrocento elements in the in the costume because the Targaryen are on the apogee of their reign. They have six dragons. They are rich. Is the top. So I wanted to show that for them, it was further than the medieval time they had already reached a little bit of the Renaissance. And especially that Miguel said to me, and Miguel and Ryan said to me, winter didn't come yet. Winter <laughs> has still to come. We are in the spring, we are in the spring. So when you think spring, you think Botticelli, that's, that's how I felt it, you feel, you feel all those colors. So, so I did pick up some elements in the costume of the of the Quattrocento, definitively. I left a lot of time, the medieval time, to, to design, to show that 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 apogee of their civilization. Did you use fabrics in did certain uh, areas like Valerian, did they use different fabrics than say they used in King's Landing? The Targaryens would do do something different. Luckily, we had the colors. Red, black, gold, that was a Targaryen. Blue, silver, gold, metal, were the Velaryon. Then after that, we have the high tower in green. You know, every family has a color. So that was quite different, quite easy to, you know, to have that. But then what was difficult was to find interesting black fabric because at a certain moment, black is black, and black is never black. You know, you have so many nuances of black, so many different structures. They had a pattern in it, and then you have to be very careful about the pattern. Luckily, we have the dragon, so I think everything with a little bit of a scale, I have been exploiting <laughs> so much. I put scales everywhere. I put dragon everywhere. You know, it's every costume is like, Let's find the dragon in it. It's a dragon in every single Targaryen costume. Whatever it is, a piece of jewelry, or a structure, of little scale, of a, of a, of a belt, of a tail, of a print, it's, and dragons are everywhere. I have little buttons which were made in the shape of the, of a, you know, of a little dragon uh, head. Uh, I, I, you have no idea. I had dragon absolutely everywhere. <laughs> but it works, it works. Oh, no, it absolutely works. I mean, the, the show is, is, is absolutely gorgeous to look at, like Game of Thrones, but like you said, I've, I've never heard it. You're absolutely right. They're, House of the Dragon is during the springtime because winter hasn't come yet. It's not even, <laughs> it's, it's coming literally hundreds of years later. So I never thought of it that way, but, but uh, the idea that it's spring in King's Landing, I, I love that. That's a great, I, uh, that's something new to think about. Now you have an incredible cast. I mean, we've only seen two episodes, so we don't know what's coming yet, but your cast, uh, <laughs> so we don't, we, I, I can't ask you that many questions because I don't want anything spoiled, but you have an amazing cast. Uh, this cast, yes. whether, you know, talk about Patty Considine or, or, uh, Rise Ifens or 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 Matt Smith, 
and then all the the the, the actresses fantastic Graham, cast. Fantastic. a fantastic cast now when you're dealing with such a large ensemble I mean, you had to make so many different costumes and keep the world straight and everything, but what's it like to work with such a large ensemble? Is it more difficult than working on a film that has less? No, it's wonderful. It was wonderful to work with this cast. They were so alert and, and in their character. No, it was great. I, I, I love them all. I love them all, and especially the new one, you know, like uh, young, uh, young Alison, Young Renira, I mean Millie and Emily, they were incredible, incredible. And they're great actresses too. I mean, they're they're, oh. and the clothes yeah. that you made for them are absolutely just gorgeous. The gowns, like when she is named as as heir in the first episode, and she's wearing that that very royal gown that she has on in the first episode at the end is it's incredible. Um, you must. Yeah, I think or, or when you're when you you're... the waging dress of Alison, which was cut. Alison had a waging dress, white and and red, which but the scene was cut. Maybe you see it later. That was also very beautiful. Um, these kinds of 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 dresses are 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 they? Are you looking to different time periods from our history to get ideas for what those dresses look like? Yes, 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 yes. Everywhere, you know, inspiration is absolutely everywhere, and uh, it all comes together at a certain moment. You can never think I've got inspired by that. You are inspired by one image and then another image, and then you put the two images together, and then you put it on the actress and the way she walks, the way she is. You put that. I mean, it's everywhere. You, you, you I never can say that was my inspiration. That was a part of my inspiration. And then another part came up and another part came up. So that's how a costume come up. And then you find the fabric and then some, and then you find the design of an embroidery and then you find, you know what I mean? It is, it's a work in progress. And then, and that one worked brilliantly. <laughs> I was, I'm very proud of it. Did you have a large crew? I mean, what is a what is a costume? It, it's like I can't imagine how many people were on your team. 150, 150, 150 to 200. Lots of people. Just the armory. The armory was like 20 people, 25. It's lots of things. Lots of things. Lots of big, 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 big crew. Huge big crew. crew. Well, you've done you've done such a great job. I mean, are there things that we should look out for uh, later on? What are some of your favorite your favorite pieces that you created so we can, because we, we haven't seen all the show yet, so we can, when we see them, we can be like, ah, what are some of your favorite things that you created? Well, you have to see the, well, you, everything. I mean, the hunt is beautiful. The wedding is beautiful. The coronation, you have to, you have to see it yourself. I don't want to give you anything. Yeah, I guess you can't I give anything know. away. Well, listen, before we wrap this up, I mean, this has been so fun to talk to you, but we always ask, what advice can you give to people that are just starting out in the business? What, what, what should people, what should they look for? What can they do? Uh, is there any advice you could give somebody who's just starting out? Maybe somebody who's just about to go into college who wants to become a designer. They have to love their job more than anything else because it's not a nine to five job. It's a job who is taking your life, like every single artistic job inspiration is from everywhere so you never stop working because you never stop feeding yourself with images sensation um inspiration you need to use that you put that all in your head and you will need it one day keep on seeing exhibition keep on reading book travel uh, go to the cinema go to film uh, uh, see as many films as you can, see as many, you know, it's so difficult to give uh, a very specific advice, but I just say that if you really love what you are doing, you will be good at it. That's what I believe. Now, can people find you? Are you on social media? Are you on Instagram at all? Can people find you on uh, Instagram? What is your Instagram name? What's your name on your Instagram account? Jani Temim, costume designer. Well, Janie, Timmy, this has been 
an incredible time. I, I can't thank you enough for speaking to us on the Designing Hollywood podcast. Your work is so amazing. And I, I feel so honored to have spoken with you. So thank you. Thank you so much for being here. Oh, thank you very much to have talked to me so late. It must be very late for you. And I'm, I'm really thankful. <laughs> uh, it's absolutely worth it. And I, I feel like I just got up this morning. <laughs> so... <laughs> Good, but go to bed then. Bye-bye. <laughs> Thank Bye-bye. you so much. And uh, I cannot wait, and all of us can't Bye. wait to watch the rest of House of the Dragon. Okay. Bye-bye, my love. Bye-bye. 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 And a special thanks to our sponsor, Paris Costumes. Paris Costumes has been a part of the history of the European theater, film, and television industry since 1856 and has become 21st century tailors. And as always, thank you to our guest costume designer, Jenny, for coming on the show. It has been such a pleasure to speak with her. A special thank you to founder and executive producer, Martika Ibarra co-founder, costume designer, the legendary Marilyn Vance, and of course, John Campia from The John Campia Show. Thank you to all of our viewers for tuning in and be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Tune into the audio version wherever you listen to podcasts. I am, of course, your host, Robert Meyer Burnett, and you can find me on Instagram at rmburnett or find me on Twitter at burnettrm or on YouTube at Post Geek Singularity. Thanks very much. Like, subscribe, and give us your comments. What would you like to see on the channel? Right down below. Thanks very much for watching, and we'll see you on the next episode of Designing Hollywood.